Morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, wherever in the world you are. Welcome to our second and final session of this year's webinar series. We're thrilled to have you join us for this very important discussion. And we're here thanks to the CGIR FCM initiative, the International Water Management Institute, and the Anticipation Hub's Anticipatory Action in Conflict Practitioners Group. My name is Shavi Sachdev, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar, When Governments Talk Anticipatory Action the silver bullet for disaster risk reduction, or just wishful thinking. We're thrilled to have you all here as we dive into this critical topic. As we're all aware, with global crises becoming more frequent and intense, anticipatory action has emerged as a promising approach to mitigating the impacts of disasters on food, land, and water systems before they escalate. Still, we must confront the slow progress in integration and implementation. So today we'll be asking some tough questions about how effectively AA has been integrated into government policies, and more importantly, whether these policies translate into real positive change on the ground. Uh, before, we be before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that discussions around anticipatory action can often occur within very male-dominated spaces, particularly in fragile and conflict-affected sittings. Um, while we have an esteemed panel of male experts today, it's important to recognize the diverse perspectives and contributions from all genders in this vital field. And with this webinar and our uh, other offerings, we hope to encourage a more inclusive dialogue as we move forward. Throughout this session, Everybody, please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts, ask questions. You can tell us who you'd like to direct it to. We'll also have a special open mic discussion later where you can engage directly with our experts. Uh, now let's take a real quick look at our agenda for the day. In order, we have coming up our panel discussion um, with our esteemed guests, followed by reactions from special guests and then an open discussion with you all. Finally, we'll have some reflections and closing remarks. To kick things off, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Alessandra Gilotta, head of the Anticipation Hub. Ale Alessandra joined Anticipation Hub in March 2024 with 20 years of experience in humanitarian emergencies and peace operations across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. She began her career with the World Food, the World Food Program, responding to emergencies in Guinea, Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And she has also worked for Oxfam's International Secretariat, Save the Children UK, the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, and Start Network. Over to you, Alessandra. Thank you very much, uh, Xavi, and, and, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to today's webinar. And I would like to also offer a special thank you to the CGER Initiative on Fragility, Conflict and Migration and the International Water Management Institute and our very known Anticipatory Action in Conflict Patricia Group, um, who have been the organizer for this, this important conversation today. Um, today's webinar comes at a very critical time as we all acknowledge the urgency of addressing and increasing uh, the frequency and severity of disaster impacting our food system, whether it's food, land, and water system globally. This is particularly important as food, land, and water systems are really a critical component of our food system. They are interconnected, but also vital that do, to ensure that people, and particularly the most vulnerable ones, are able to meet their urgent food and nutrition needs and that they can improve and sustain a livelihood opportunity within their own community. As we know very well, the climate change, conflict, economic shocks, and environmental degradation, those are threatening, threatening this system, exacerbating food insecurity and increasing the risk of disaster. However, against this backdrop, anticipatory action is one of the solution at our disposal. As you may know, anticipatory action is a proactive approach that enables organizations, governments, community to act early um, based on early warning signal before disaster happen. Over the past 10 years, anticipatory action has become a widely accepted approach to save life and protect livelihoods. 
Last year alone, in 2023, over 12.8 million people were reached through anticipatory actions in over 47 countries across the globe. Um, anticipatory action, you know, has been taken to prevent and mitigate uh, potential impact of hazard before the shock or before the acute impacts are felt, uh, based on on the prediction on how the event will unfold. Therefore, if we take this tool, um, anticipatory action, we can really integrate it into national policies and framework that are related to food, land, and water system can really help mitigate the risk and support enhancing resilience. We at the Anticipation Hub, um, we believe this is very much the case and we are working towards that. Uh, we are a joint initiative of the German Red Cross, the IFRC and the Red Cross and Red Crescent Climate Center. We aim at promoting the learning exchanges and advocacy and also most importantly, increasing not only the accessibility, but also the knowledge of anticipatory action to facilitate a collective scaling of anticipatory action and protect people at risk of disaster. And this is today's webinar is such an example uh, that we support practitioners coming together and discuss this important topic. As the Anticipation Hub, we are committed to facilitate the knowledge sharing and collaborations among stakeholders to really implement effective anticipatory action strategies. Also, what it's important for me to set the scene today is that anticipatory action, as mentioned, is started as a purely humanitarian approach about 10 years ago now, is now slowly becoming a more government-owned approach. And we are seeing more and more regional intergovernmental bodies that have or are developing strategy to integrate anticipatory action into their systems or disaster risk management framework. Uh, we have a distinguished panelist today uh, that they will uh, just explain and share some of those case studies. And also we see more and more national government working on integrating anticipatory action into their, into their disaster risk management framework. Just to mention a few, you know, the Philippines, the Bangladesh, uh, Mozambique, Pakistan. So uh, there, is, there is some good example to follow and also challenges to share and learn from. And for us as an, the anticipation of, if you really want to achieve the full potential of anticipatory action, we believe um, we, that we need to build and we need to strengthen the systems, national system and for anticipatory actions, um, and also equally improve the one that are already out there to ensure no one is left behind. So the hub, together with the International Management, Water Management Institute, the CGER, and all the partners, they are seeking to support and strengthen the institutionalization of anticipatory action within the national government and country system that do present uh, the opportunity for scale, for impact, and sustainabilities. Um, and so within that, I would really encourage all the participants in the webinar today to really engage actively into the discussion, um, really emphasizing and bringing and sharing the importance of sharing experiences, lesson learned, and really have a frank conversation of what works and what doesn't work, uh, because this is all, uh, you know, complement and influence and contribute to our own respective work, and also, most importantly, to the research um, agenda um, that colleagues here uh, are really focusing on, including the International Water Management Institute, um, and so please do, do um, come forward and, and really participate um, and share your opinions um, on, on this debate today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandra, for those insightful remarks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished panel who will lead us through today's conversation. First, we're, drop, uh, we're joined by Mohammad Idris Mehsood, a member of the civil service of Pakistan for over 20 years. Since 2017, he's been the head of the Disaster Risk Reduction Wing of the National Disaster Management Authority in Pakistan, where he leads AA efforts. Idris has over 15 years of experience in administrative, diplomatic, and humanitarian fields. 
He's also played a key role in formulating Pakistan's first national disaster risk reduction policy. His expertise has been vital in transitioning Pakistan from reactive to proactive disaster management approaches. Very glad to have you here, Idris. And we are also fortunate to have Dr. George Otiono, the thematic lead for anticipatory action in East Africa at the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Climate Prediction and Applications Center. Currently, he chairs the Regional Technical Working Group on AA. He's had over 10 years of experience in providing weather and climate information for decision making. He's also led the development of triggers for major hazards and a regional roadmap on anticipatory action for Eastern Africa. Welcome, George. We're so happy to have you here. And we're going to kick off uh, by moving on to exploring whether anticipatory action truly is the silver bullet for disaster risk reduction or whether that's simply wishful thinking. We'll have a few rounds of questions for uh, for you both uh, linked around some themes and we'll, we'll just have very, very little time, although you're experts, uh, we have to limit you to about four minutes uh, to respond. Uh, you can feel free to add your uh, questions and comments uh, for all our audience who are following along, put them in the chat as we go and we will circle back to them during the open mic discussion. So let's uh, let's unmute our mics and we'll start um, with uh, Idris. So uh, you've worked to strengthen disaster risk management over the years, and Pakistan has also faced numerous natural disasters over the years. The 2022 floods come to mind. So how has the National Disaster Management Agency worked to institutionalize anticipatory action within the country's disaster management frameworks? Is there an example? where AA has been embedded into national or even provincial government policies that you could share with us. Thank you. Uh, I thank the organizers, particularly the anticipation hub for giving us this opportunity and organizing this webinar. It's indeed uh, fruitful to interact with colleagues from other jurisdictions and countries uh, to learn about what they have been doing. Uh, you, you, Alessandra was uh, was was correct that uh, now it has gone beyond the humanitarian community, and the governments are increasingly focusing on uh, anticipatory actions as as a, as a policy process. Uh, similarly, you know, we in Pakistan, the humanitarian community, I must give them credit for for introducing and then uh, working on anticipatory actions in a structured manner. Uh, till the time, you know, the government took it as part of uh, its own process. Uh, here in Pakistan, we, we learned its efficacy and its, it being very fruitful uh, in saving lives particularly and also property. But, uh, you know, for, uh, as, as one of the lessons learned of uh, the mega floods of 2022, where we, you know, lost, uh, we, we had the losses and damages to the tune of US $30 billion and uh, over 33 million people affected. Uh, we, we, we have now uh, thought and we, we gave it a practical, we, we practically implemented anticipatory actions and early actions as they call it. Uh, we now, uh, very recently, uh, you know, in, in government processes, you uh, even if uh, you being an official uh, understand the efficacy of something you need to work and 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 continuously strive to to place it on the national agenda or the government agenda so there we had a hard uh, uh, initially we had hard hard time and tough times but uh, thank thanks to our new leadership the chairman and dma himself was very much forthcoming in implementing its spirit reactions and then you know we 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 institutionalized in spirit reactions in a manner that uh, the national disaster management authority which works under the prime minister's office directly uh, it took it as its own agenda and uh, we alhamdulillah now have a national anticipatory action national coordination forum for anticipatory action where we we uh, the government shares it with the with the key stakeholders and uh, we have uh, 
we have established uh, not, not only this natural coordination forum, but also five sub thematic areas where uh, the government, the NDMA is co-chairing with concerned uh, humanitarian partner like FAO, uh, WHH, uh, UNOCHA, and other partners that are that are advising us, um, helping us in uh, institutionalizing and spirit reactions in our policy processes, in our planning processes, and and all other uh, initiatives. Uh, I would come to uh, uh, later on. I, I'll I'll have some examples to quote where we we had a lot of. Uh, good practices and I will have some proposals for the anticipatory hub also to, to, to patronize the anticipatory actions globally. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm sure they will be all ears and collaboration of course is really key to everything that we uh, aim to do. Uh, moving on to uh, George, as the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Climate Pre Prediction and Application Center, um, how have you supported member states in incorporating anticipatory action into their policies when it comes to regional climate-related disaster preparedness? What role does regional collaboration play in ensuring AA is institutionalized across East Asia? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever we are. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, discussion. IGAD hosts a member, a member countries of, of seven, eight countries, and also with the mandate to provide climate services and related application. So IGAD has been uh, working with the member states to develop one, one way in which IGAD is uh, supporting member states to institutionalize and spread action is through development of systems and frameworks. For instance, when you talk about the regional IGAD, IGAD, IGAD disaster risk um, uh, strategy, which is running from 2019 to 2030 and also linked to the Sindai framework, it's a, it's a, a protocol that guides the member states on how develop their protocols as well, ensuring that it's aligned to uh, the regional and also to the global uh, best practices. Another an another framework that has also been developed by IGAD as a, as a mechanism to support the countries, the IGAD multi-hazard early warning, because we realize that uh, the hazards are multiple and happen in uh, so many uh, uh, times. So there is that need to have a, a framework on how the region or the countries can approach the multi-hazards in terms of the, the framework, the systems within. So lately, we also have come up with a regional uh, roadmap on, on anticipatory action, which is a, a document that tries to provide a harmony or a direction in the region, the countries on how do they implement the anticipatory action. So countries are already beginning to align, realign in their strategies, especially on the national roadmaps to the regional roadmap that is already in place. Also to link to this is the, the capacity development and support. Yes, so IGAD is uh, through different uh, capacity development and initiatives. IGAD is supporting the member states, the capacity development, the capacity building, trainings on uh, disaster risk management, on cross-border uh, issues, uh, like we talk about uh, desert locust. And, and just last week, uh, there was a training with regards to this. All these are uh, linked and are, are, are geared towards how the region can address its challenges, the multi-hazard aspect of the same. And also lastly is about policy alignment. Yeah, the policy alignment, which also relates to some of the strategies that IGAD is developing with the countries. Of course, currently we are talking about how the, even the disaster 
bill, uh, the disaster risk management bill, national level, would also be reviewed. A good example is uh, Kenya. Kenya has also started reviewing its uh, DRM policies, and with support of IGAD countries, so sorry, with support of IGAD, trying to realign, include its part of action within the bill so that uh, this institutionalization and sustainability of anticipatory action within government. Thank you. Thank you, that's really quite inspiring. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome Daniel Obot, the Director of Disaster Risk Reduction at the National Emergency Management Agency in Nigeria. Daniel has extensive experience and knowledge in this field, particularly with the Nigeria Famine Early Warning Systems. He's a lead senior officer responsible for national mobilization on AA, risk re reduction and response, relief and rehabilitation. Welcome, Daniel. Um, we're going to actually move on to the practical Good impact afternoon. of anticipatory action on disaster. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to, um, we'll just add you to the panel right here. And um, sorry. The, um, we're going to move on to the practical impact of anticipatory action on disaster risk reduction. And I'll start with you, uh, Daniel, since you've just joined us. Um, would you uh, be able to highlight a case where anticipatory action in Nigeria led to concrete disaster risk reduction outcomes that you've seen? Uh, we'd love to know where and how early interventions have influenced overall disaster responses and helped protect vulnerable communities, if you could uh, share something of that. Uh, once again, good afternoon. Uh, let me strongly apologize for joining late. There were we're, so many is issues. We're, we're very happy to up. have you. Yeah, there are so many issues coming up because uh, later today, I will hand over as Director of Disaster Redu Risk Reduction. So I was trying other things to tidy up. I at the on the course of this, or maybe at the end, I will give you uh, the particulars of another officer that uh, this forum will be talking to in relation to disaster risk reduction in Nigeria. But yeah. I can be contacted under private arrangement, but for government officials, I will give you another details. Thank well, you we're very happy much. to catch you on your very last day. Yes. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> so if, if, if there are some early interventions that you could uh, talk to us about, we would love to hear in your uh, vast experience where AA has actually uh, helped with disaster risk reduction outcomes. Yes, uh, in, uh, in Nigeria, what we do for disaster risk reduction, we take cognizance of early warning information to various communities and uh, our early warning uh, for disaster risk reduction is from two perspectives. The one that has to do with the nature-induced disasters and the one that has to do with human-induced disasters. And in this respect, there are statutory government institutions that are responsible for sending out early warning information that we take from there and cascade it to the affected communities. In Nigeria, for nature-induced disasters, especially that will have to do with rainfall and flood, we have Nigeria Meteorological Agency, NIMET, that gives focus on patterns of rainfall across the country. When that is done by NIMET, then Nigeria Hydraulic Services Agency, NISA, will analyze that rainfall pattern by NIMET and then give to us the likely flood train in the country. And for this year, it was flood train was classified into three categories. The highly probable flood risk areas and the moderately probable flood risk areas and the low flood risk areas. They will give us this information in, uh, on local government basis. 
uh, Nigeria will run a three tiers of government, the federal, state, and local government. So we have about 774 local government areas. This is the level of government that uh, handles grassroots and community issues. So the plot pattern will reflect what will happen at local government levels. So when this is given, we take this and uh, carry out what we call downscaling of early warning information to communities for early actions so that the damage and losses that will arise due to non-compliance or non-implementation of early warning alert could be drastically checked. For this year, I led teams to many states. And during that visit to the states, we spell out disaster risk reduction actions and activities that state should undertake. Then the activities that the local government authorities should undertake then the responsibility of communities so that at these levels, everybody will get involved in actions that will reduce uh, flood damage and losses in our dear country. Then on human-induced disasters, there is an institution known as Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. IPC are an Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. That handles indicators, early warnings for human-induced uh, disasters. Then we take from there to these communities that they have predicted that they will have one or two issues. And some of these early warning alerts from Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution involve security components. So we will liaise with the military, with the Air Force, with the Army, and all those security formations for them to analyze their own aspects and take actions in order to reduce uh, disasters and uh, ensure early compliance and early actions by state and local government authorities. Thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that I, I'm really impressed with all the levels that you've put into place, and I'm sure everybody can learn a lot from that. Um, I'll turn now to um, Idris. In your leadership role in AA in Pakistan, uh, maybe you could share with us a recent instance where anticipatory action has had a measurable impact. Uh, maybe a case where early interventions helped reduce damage or improve preparedness for a vulnerable community. Uh, I'm thinking refugees, IDPs, host communities, or other uh, places like that. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I must admit that anticipatory actions have really benefited Pakistan. Uh, particularly, I would give you three examples very quickly. In this, we, we, we are revisited by monsoon seasons every, every year. And this year, uh, the National Disaster Management Authority, with warnings, uh, uh, reminded the provincial disaster management authorities and district disaster management authorities to implement anticipatory actions. And um, Trust me, we, the National Disaster Management Authority didn't have to intervene in response. So it was taken care of by, by the relevant authorities and we had significantly reduced losses this year. Uh, I'll give you example, two examples of last year when we had a Viper Joy um, cyclone uh, uh, coming to, to Pakistan and Indian side. Uh, though it diverted at the Alamatar to mostly to the Indian side, but, uh, you know, we were monitoring it 15 days before and all the anticipatory actions were in place. The government was itself taking lead and we, 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 we evacuated over 83,000 population. We, we mapped the area with the risk, uh, prior risk knowledge available databases. We evacuated people for uh, a couple of, uh, like four days. And then, uh, Alhamdulillah, we had no death last year due to that cyclone. And similar cyclone in 1999 uh, caused us over 6,200 lives lost. And we, we, we sustained those people in camps 
with the help of, uh, of course, led by the government and some humanitarian community. And then we brought them back to their places. Th this was one example. The second example was then when we had, we have Eastern rivers where mostly, you know, water, uh, when there is uh, more rainfall on the, on the catchment areas in the, on the Indian side, then they, 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 they release water and we have very less time to respond. So we evacuated over 4.5 million people. A lot of other actions were there and we evacuated them. We, we relocated them to, to camps, some to host families and uh, very, very less damage. And their valuables were also shifted from the, from the riverbeds or the near, or the areas which were, uh, which were reportedly being threatened. So we, we implemented those and this year, all those authorities at district at local level were, were alert beforehand. And they, they took those prior actions also like, like cleaning of water drains, uh, pre-positioning stocks, identifying of uh, relief camps, uh, pre-positioning the, the, the camp, camping um, and, uh, and establishing them, uh, having um, also preparedness drills, mock exercises, simulation exercises. We had over 22 simulation exercises at National Emergencies Operation Center. So that was one of the, uh, th those were a few examples. And now we are, um, all the government authorities have uh, realized its benefits and they implement uh, such actions beforehand with credible early warnings and dissemination of early warnings. Thank you. Well, I think I, I'm sure everybody agrees that is very laudatory uh, and impressive that you've implemented that and, and no lives have been lost. Um, moving to uh, the African, uh, East Africa region, uh, George, in your experience, how has anticipatory action translated into disaster risk reduction at the regional level? Are there recent events such as droughts or floods where AA was critical in reducing the impacts across East Africa that you could share with us? Oh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, just to mention that, uh, as you know, AA is uh, an evolving and developing uh, subject in most of the institutions and even within the government. Most people are still on the course to develop um, their systems and programs to align to that. But I would just share one example in in Somalia. So uh, the flood case when he got together with the disaster risk uh, operation for Somalia, we call it SODMA, Somalia Disaster uh, Operation. Uh, management authority. Uh, so IGAD supported uh, the SODMA, the disaster management, to come up with the uh, thresholds and triggers when the flood was, uh, it was just a season uh, before the flood, the onset of the flood. So there were thresholds that were developed for catchment areas, for about five catchment areas. So these were used to trigger actions when the thresholds were surpassed, at least for the five areas or catchment areas. So out of those, uh, three of uh, the catchment areas, I would say, were successful in that the anticipatory actions that were deactivated led to, uh, as of now, I, I still don't have the exact the quantification of the lives that were saved or the property but there were enormous uh, a report of uh, a property that was saved as a result because early warning was issued. Uh, people were also able to relocate to safe grounds so that uh, the flood from the catchment areas do not uh, cause displacement of, the, of the, the, the settlements. And also recently in Ethiopia, that as, as a result of drought and, and the triggers when the trigger for drought were already met, uh, one of the agencies, the World Food Program, reached about 208 million population out of uh, 5 million people 
with anticipatory action and also some uh, together with the emergency uh, aids. And this also saved or reduced the number of um, malnutrition that has been frequent in such places. I'm just using those uh, two examples to demonstrate how anticipatory action is being applied in the region and more to, for risk management. I see my one minute is up and I'm also done. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. Uh, all, all three of you have been uh, quite, it's been illustrative that obviously preparedness and having plans in action, having data and all, all of your uh, stakeholders involved from human humanitarian organizations, but also the government have been crucial in saving lives and uh, protecting vulnerable populations. But let's move on now to the challenges in implementing anticipatory action. So uh, let me start with Daniel again. Um, what have been key challenges in Nigeria in implementing anticipatory action particularly in ensuring that there is a move from policy to practice. So how has NEMA addressed issues such as resource constraints or, you know, in every organization, there are issues like coordination gaps. So if, if you could address that, Daniel. Thank you very much. I will derive our challenge from, pri from priority one of the Sendai framework. That is understanding of disaster risk. That is a challenge in Nigeria because before now, in our dear country, disaster management has been understood in the area of humanitarian relief assistance. So the introduction of disaster risk reduction that has to do with finding the causes of the disasters, the practical, what the, I call uh, practical solutions, has been a major issue. So we are emphasizing enlightenment to bring everybody on board on the understanding that relief assistance does not address the root causes of disasters. Only that it improves the situation of disaster affected persons. So with the inadequate understanding of disaster risk, it poses a problem for the people to understand what should be the actions. So that is one of the major issues that we are emphasizing seriously. Calling on the state government, calling on the local government, calling on the government institutions that there is the need to shift from humanitarian relief assistance to disaster risk reductions that involves practical actions, practical activities. So that is the major uh, challenge in our dear country, which we hope as we are making effort, immediately we, we, we overcome that. A government will uh, put some resources, and we have under, and we have started to emphasize that. So that is the major issue because if they do not understand disaster risk management from that perspective, bringing out money for disaster risk reduction activities uh, is a problem. So face that understanding is what we have seen as the major challenge. That is so interesting because, of course, unless you address where uh, the data, the research is pointing you, anything you try to do to mitigate it is then just throwing darts uh, in the in the dark. So thank you for that. Um, uh, George, I'll turn to you to ask uh, what unique challenges the IGAD APAC uh, faces when you implement uh, AA in conflict prone or fragile areas. Uh, how have you adapted AA strategies to ensure they remain effective in these complex environments. So thank you very much. Uh, so ICPAC is uh, supporting countries even the conflict prone areas, the federal context. Uh, some of those are those cutting uh, issues, and IGAD has uh, developed 
maybe before I go to this, I would just say one of the challenges has been access access uh, to such areas during fragile context and even uh, conflict. It's really, really uh, difficult to access such areas even for to get to gather information and data. God has to maybe suspend some of the operations in such situations when he had uh, a conflict in Sudan and uh, part of uh, Ethiopia. It's really been difficult. So one of the challenges has been access. Second is also weak governance. Uh, you realize in such situations, the coordination aspect uh, from government, because ICPAC, IGAD works with the government agencies in the countries, in such situations, the, uh, the, government, the governance structure is very weak and volatile and becomes difficult to access information that is needed to develop or maybe to come up with the AA. And also one, one of the scientific issue dealing, grappling with is in the conflict setup, whether you do the anticipatory action or you do, do the emergency response, that is that is one of those uh, uh, questions which are still not clear. Whether on conflict in, in conflict setup, is it the AA that you do or you do an emergency response? An issue, uh, a way to mitigate this or what ICPAC is trying to respond is to have a coordination framework through cross-border and what I call the cluster. Cluster now brings countries that share similar challenges together. In such a way, it becomes very easy to coordinate that from a, a regional aspect rather than approaching it from a country-based. For example, one cluster could, could focus on countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, and even um, uh, Sudan. And so addressing challenges, the commonality of challenges in such contexts becomes very, uh, very easy. And also we are also trying to uh, in, in, uh, consider certain uh, initiatives when they come up to consider conflict setup, developing uh, thresholds and triggers and anticipatory actions for conflict beyond the end of fragile context. Of course, this we do with the, member, the partners, especially those who have uh, direct access to the ground, like World Food Program, uh, the Danish Refugee Council that are dealing with displacement and the likes. So those two aspects are part, partly what we are, how we are trying to address or approach uh, AA in such a fragile context. Thank you. Uh, that is quite interesting. And I, I think the clusters idea makes sense, especially when you're looking at different geographies or uh, a set of risks that are specific to a topography or a geology rather than a, a country, which is, of course, a much mm -hmm. wider thing. Um, Idris, in a country like Pakistan, which does have diverse geographical challenges, um, given that you are involved at both the policy and operational levels, how has the government addressed challenges such as resource limitation or even interagency coordination uh, to ensure effective implementation of AA? Yes, um, as you may be aware that Pakistan is a large country with diverse topographical features. In uh, one part of the country, we would be facing uh, monsoon season and uh, rainfalls, uh, flash flooding or riverine flooding, while in the other part of the country, we would be managing drought situation, or uh, we would also be having a glacial lake outburst flooding uh, in, in another part of the country. Um, you would agree that, you know, uh, resource allocation is one of the key challenge. And um, it is very, very normal till now that uh, governments, donors, all the uh, all the partners, it, they, they are quite slow in allocating funds or resources beforehand in, 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 in anticipation. They are very quick in uh, once uh, you are hit hard, with, by a disaster, then uh, relief or response allocations, uh, humanitarian funding flows in. Uh, that that is one challenge. Uh, the, we we also uh, uh, face the same, and particularly when uh, you know an anticipatory action when you 
when you have a credible forecast according to your own assessments and uh, you issue early warnings and you spend money on anticipatory actions and uh, what if uh, it comes out it 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 uh, comes out entirely different situation uh, 10 15 days down the line so uh, people one you they would uh, the 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 um, the agencies or the stakeholders that are responsible for accountability would start accountability and uh, and then uh, the, the it's it's more uh, challenging when it comes to the communities when you ask them that uh, that this action needs to be taken and um, the forecast uh, and and that situation doesn't unfold the way you visualize or forecast that is a challenging situation we uh, in pakistan what we have done is that with this coordination forum and the national emergencies operations center forum we have a strong coordination we have uh, uh, our response mechanism is outlined in a three tiered format uh, category 1 2 and 3 uh, in 3 we we the national level comes in category 1 is the localized phenomena where the local agencies are required to and category 2 when the provinces are required so we have requested all the three tiers to have resource allocation at their own levels and that is one way and our coordination mechanism is very uh, is improving it is fairly strong and we have also uh, developed a guideline for a guidebook which is available on our website for all the three tiers to our for our communities for um, rescue services for government agencies what actions they need to take so those are prescriptive uh, guides uh, these are open for for improvement and we hope that we'll continue uh, evolving the system in much better uh, situation the, the the ultimate need is to have uh, a dedicated funding line or funds or resources beforehand to to deal specifically with with the spirit reactions that's so true not just funding but also a pipeline of information that can be accessed by stakeholders at every level so thank you thank you for sharing that that's uh, extremely interesting to hear of what pakistan is doing as well um all all three of you uh, george uh, daniel and idris uh, thank you uh, you've been amazing i'm sure our participants will have questions and uh, we'll, we request everybody to use the chat to share your questions as well as any thoughts and responses you may have for our panel. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to move on to hearing from two special guests who bring unique insights on anticipatory action from humanitarian and research perspectives uh, that we, we're uh, hoping to hear uh, more perspectives on. So with us is Afroza Haq. Uh, she's the program lead for anticipation and forecast based financing at the German Red Cross in Bangladesh. Afroza is a seasoned international humanitarian and development professional with over a decade of experience and her work spans across the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, the UN and various national and international NGOs. Uh, Afroza has left groundbreaking global projects, including anticipatory action and forecast based, based financing which helps foster early action and climate resistance resilience in Bangladesh. Welcome, Afroza. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Desai Mabumbo, the Senior Researcher for Climate Risk Management and Disaster Resilience at the International Water Management Institute. His expertise lies in analyzing and mitigating potential hazards, crafting robust climate-informed disaster risk reduction plans, and leveraging diverse research methods for effective risk management. Uh, welcome, Decide. Uh, so let's let's head to Bangladesh. Afroza, we've all heard from the panel, but uh, we'd like to hear your insights from a humanitarian perspective on the integration of forecast-based financing within anticipatory action and the impacts you've seen on disaster preparedness in Bangladesh. If you could take um, a few minutes maybe five at most to share your thoughts. We'd be really grateful for your insights from the field. Uh, thank you, Shabi, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'll briefly share our experience here in Bangladesh and starting from uh, the forecast-based financing project that we started back in 2015, uh, which was the background from where this 
total concept of anti creation came from. So when we started uh, anti uh, forecast with financing project in Bangladesh in 2015, that was the uh, uh, beginning of this concept. Uh, and that time we were actually struggling a bit uh, with the concept or uh, we didn't have any proven hand uh, to show or, or advocate with the government and others, but like, and still the concept was at a very initial stage, uh, at a very initial uh, development stage. We were like, we had to spend significant amount of time to uh, convince government and other stakeholders uh, uh, to uh, like, Show them the difference between the conventional DRR and on and uh, the forecast based financing, uh, especially uh, the difference between preparedness and and FBF. Uh, from there and now here we are uh, with uh, like more than forty five agencies being part of the anticipated direction on ground, and uh, like now we have the uh, national task force uh, being led by the Minister of Disaster Management and Relief and. Uh, we have a technical working group with member of uh, 45 agencies in country. Uh, we have several funding uh, mechanism in country, like for the movement, a Red Cross Red Crescent movement, it's the draft funding mechanism from UN, uh, uh, the surf funding mechanism uh, from Start Network, they have their own funding mechanism, and several projects in country led by different agencies. Uh, so, so the changes from there to now is significant in country. Uh, but it was not easy for us uh, to be here. We had to go through a roller coaster ride, I'd say, because uh, the initial stage, uh, like as we didn't have enough proof in hand, we had to gather evidence for the government to convince them with the concept of forecast based financing. Later, like from 2019, we started to call it uh, anticipatory action um, uh, because, like, uh, FBI has become more uh, of a movement uh, uh, internal uh, uh, concept rather than. Uh, uh, national, uh, like globally uh, acknowledged term, and then it turned at, as anticipated direction. And uh, with few evidence of some of our piloting back in 2015, 16, 17, um, uh, we were able to con uh, convince the government to uh, like uh, be part of our journey. And uh, it was good that in from 2019, it was. Uh, being uh, incorporated in the standing order on disaster, which is the major government uh, document to uh, reduce, uh, to uh, like act on uh, before or during any disaster, which only had the response uh, part on it. But like in 2019, during the revision, it was being incorporated, uh, the forecast based financing. And also there, uh, uh, the government also formed the task force, which was being led by the Minister of Disaster Management really, but like, like uh, 18 other government ministries were being part of it, uh, including um, eight uh, uh, development partners, UN, uh, NGO, INGO, and also uh, Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, where BDRC is a balanced Red Crescent Society, they have a significant role to play. Um, uh, they're from the piloting because they've, Balanced Red Crescent Society is now like globally one of the uh, lead agencies uh, like giving example on anticipatory action um, and like showcasing uh, the progress they made in country. Uh, there are significant uh, uh, like um, uh, upholding from the government and scaling up because when we started, we started uh, with uh, a hazard like flood and cyclone and then from there now several other uh, hazards are being covered and also uh, like uh, not only uh, 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 movement, but also different agencies have their own protocols uh, in country and government now have their own protocol too. The government this year has up to two national early action protocol, which are on cyclone and flood. So overall uh, it's been a good journey for us to start from zero to till now. Oh, well, thank you. That's a really interesting uh, information coming out of Bangladesh. I'm sure our uh, listeners uh, appreciate it and will also try to use it as a template uh, if they aren't already. Uh, let's now shift our focus to the role of research in supporting anticipatory action. We've uh, mentioned it a few times so far, but decide perhaps you can tell us more about how research, especially in water management and climate prediction, has helped shape anticipatory action in Africa. And do you think it's been challenging to sustain these efforts beyond pilot projects? If you could take uh, the next five minutes to share your thoughts, we'd be very appreciative. 
Okay, um, thank you very much and uh, hello colleagues um, to quite an interesting and uh, useful uh, discussion on anticipatory action. Um, so <clears throat> from the international water management, um, we, we focus on supporting anticipatory action through research and generating evidence. And uh, we, we emphasize the use of um, data-driven insights uh, in, in water management, food and land water uh, systems and climate predictions. And um, the, the idea really is to, to have uh, this research to inform um, government policy and also disaster response protocols. So um, <clears throat> as the International Water Management Institute, we have um, uh, collaborated with a number of uh, in uh, institutions, uh, government institutions, uh, other research institutions, uh, local organizations, and also farmers. Uh, to ensure that uh, the implementation of anticipatory action is both uh, scientifically grounded and also operationally feasible. So I'll give an example of um, the work that we are doing um, under the climate, the, the fragility, conflict and migration initiative. We are um, partnering with the um, World Food Programme in Ethiopia and uh, carrying out research. We have just uh, recently finished research in the Somali region of Ethiopia where we are exploring the implementation of um, anticipatory action in complex emergencies. As you'll be aware of the context in the Somali region that they are carrying droughts, uh, sometimes also political um, uh, conflict and also flooding incidences and uh, also health risks. So we carrying out um, forensic analysis of the flood events that uh, happened in 2023 uh, with the view that um, the findings from this research can actually inform the effective implementation of uh, anticipatory action. Um, we are not only in, in Ethiopia, uh, more broadly, we have done uh, similar studies in, in Pakistan uh, and, and um, Zambia as well. Uh, we are partnering with local organizations in Zambia and also in Zimbabwe in developing uh, these anticipatory action plans. And this is not only at the, the national level, we are also going into the sub-national level um, trying to, to implement some of the innovative uh, solutions that are coming out from the research and also including carrying out um, hazard-specific simulations. Um, so more broadly, we, we view the integration of anticipatory action in the institutional, legislative, and policy framework as a critical success factor for the implementation of uh, anticipatory action. And... Um, we continue to carry out uh, studies such as the forensic analysis that I've highlighted uh, to ensure that such findings can be integrated into uh, government um, uh, development plans. Um, in terms of um, challenges, I think um, like what previous speakers have also highlighted that anticipatory action is still a, a novel idea in, in some places and the uptake uh, of uh, some of the solutions might be a bit low at the moment. But this also brings into play the idea that we should carry out more research so that whatever anticipatory action is done is based on um, scientifically grounded um, uh, evidence and also uh, best practices. So yeah, I would con uh, um, conclude by saying that um, we, we hope as the International Water Management Institute we continue collaborating with uh, the different organizations uh, in um, spearheading the implementation of uh, anticipatory action. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, they've been instrumental in bringing so many different projects and stakeholders together. I'm sure they will continue to do that uh, with everybody's participation and encouragement. Um, thank you to, to both Afroza and Desai. Uh, you've been wonderful. It's been really amazing and exceptional to have your insights. So um, I want to now open the floor for an open discussion. Um, anyone who has a question or a thought uh, can raise their hand and it'll, we'll invite you to join the conversation. Um, our panelists and special guests are here to answer your questions. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you have your own experiences in integrating anticipatory action into policy. Uh, we have diverse participants today from all around the world, so don't be, sp don't be shy, speak up, or uh, we might start choosing people randomly. Um, to start with, we have a, a question from Greenwell Machaya. Uh, Greenwell, could we uh, ask you to turn on your mic and perhaps ask the question yourself? Y yes, 
Sure. Uh, uh, first, obviously, thank you very much for very insightful presentations. I mean, from the practitioners as well as from the research perspective, I think this is great. Uh, I was just wondering, though, I mean, we are, oh, I, I'm also from the International Water Management Institute. I'm an economist based in Pretoria. Um, and there's a uh, further to the work that DECIDE is doing. We also kind of uh, focusing on another uh, piece of work in Zambia, where we're trying to look at the anticipated actions to start saying, so that we, we are able to say, okay, Maybe in this case, it's better to choose this one and not this one, because when disaster hits, you can think of many anticipated actions. So what is that optimal set of anticipated actions that you need in order to really uh, do uh, and minimize uh, the damage? Uh, but one question that I have always been confronted with in my mind is that uh, Sometimes to convince the uh, the stakeholders or the policymakers to take those actions because they're taking them before sometimes the disaster actually hits, it's not as easy. So in in the in practice, uh, uh, so colleagues from IGAD or Pakistan, uh, et cetera, have you had a situation whereby you propose an anticipated action, but then the government says, okay, you know what? Uh, I think you, the figures uh, uh, of damage, et cetera, are not convincing. You are not convincing us enough as to whether doing nothing is not actually the best thing. Have you ever uh, come across something like that? Because it would appear that that's what might happen. I mean, I was, we we're asking questions that, for example, in countries which are often prone to droughts, why don't they do something uh, every time the drought hits? they're in trouble. I mean, so why don't they deploy some anticipated actions? Is it that they don't believe when they're told? Uh, or is it that the figures are not as convincing? So I just wanted to know, have you ever had a situation where you, you advise them to do something, but then they just feel like the numbers are not convincing enough? Over to you. Um, perhaps uh, George can take that one first, and um, Idris, if, if you'd like to add, or Afroza uh, to this. Thank, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I want to start by saying yes, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the anticipatory action bit is still a concept that is not very clear to most people and even the government. But if you look at even the the pillars of the anticipatory action, I will start from hazards to actions to pre-financing. The pre-financing bit is still a challenge because the government, you just want to refinance based on, because the focus currently what is available is facile, probabilistic in nature. So the hesitance by the government is always that, what is the assurance that the probability you're giving is not going to turn out to be the opposite. And until now, the government is convinced, and I think I like the the work research work that is being done by the the Institute of uh, Water Management, because we need to continue building the evidence base of research so that government can be convinced that this thing is worth it refinancing because that is where uh, still we have a challenge. So in, in summary, yes, we've had cases, of course, we work with the, the government institutions. We have we have had cases in Kenya, we've had cases in uh, Ethiopia, we've had cases in Uganda where the government just says, no, we can't, we can't take any action based on what you're telling us because they're not, not just convinced. Yeah, and the question would, would still be asked whether and special action is replacing the normal DRM uh, cycle, which 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 the answer is it doesn't replace; it complements the normal DRM cycle, and so such kind of discussions, awareness, and and information needs to be, in my view, clear before uh, as we continue doing research, and the advocacy part of it uh, to mainstream this in the government system. Hope I answered your question. Uh, yeah. 
Um, indeed, and and we have somebody who works in civil society and also the government. Uh, so Idris, if that's if there's something you'd like to add, uh, please do. Oh, uh, you're muted. If you could just uh, turn your mic on, please. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was just saying that since we are ourselves government, and when we are convinced or decide, we we are pretty much clear in uh, and we, we implement that. But, you know, the larger government like Ministry of Finance, uh, we, we face challenges in allocating sufficient resources to carry out those actions. That is a challenge. Right. And Afroza, you've been on the end of reaching out to the governments with yes. all this research and data and then building a case for it. What what um, I mean, if you have something you'd like to add? Sure. To we have actually several experience on this one where we are uh, we're approaching the government and, and the government was a bit reluctant on going forward with this one uh, because uh, like we didn't have enough evidence at the very beginning. And then when we had evidence, it was not enough to convince the government or it was not showing them some certain figures that was enough to convince them. And then uh, also when we were piloting, we had the experience where we did trigger and, and uh, the hazard, hazard didn't impacted much as, as it was being forecasted. Uh, so we had several scenarios uh, throughout the journey. And then uh, like in different cases, we had to come up with different solutions like where uh, it didn't reach uh, the trigger level or the cyclone hit in a different area. After that, this uh, whole concept of no regret or, or act in vain uh, came up back in 2016 when uh, we had a cyclone scenario and it, it hit in a totally different areas. And based on that one, we did convince the government later on, uh, showing that like, well, though it didn't hit the, the area, it was being forecasted or the track is showing. But the fact is, the assistance the community received, it actually helped them to reduce us uh, to like increase their resilience and that helped them uh, uh, to prepare themselves for, for the next hazard and, and they were well aware and they, they were receiving uh, the forecast well ahead of time and uh, the, uh, we were providing actually cash assistance and that helped them to take some early actions that actually reduced uh, 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 the impact on the community. Though it didn't hit directly, but like uh, still there were some impact on that community and it reduced the impact. And with all those evidence, with with the some uh, strong case studies uh, from the community, with uh, uh, the government joining us for some of the community visit and others, we were able to convince the government on all these things and they actually later on understand that like the marginalized community uh, with a very small amount of support they uh, it actually helped them uh, to reduce their vulnerability because whether uh, it happened or not whether the intensity was not that much but still it helped them to reduce their vulnerability on ground and help them being a bit more resilient uh, for the hazard with all the uh, forecasted early warning and, and the equipment or support that we provided. So uh, it took some time for us to go for it, but uh, uh, it worked uh, with time, with effort and with like proper level of, of uh, advocacy with the government. Right. It sounds like a very uphill task, but uh, congratulations on succeeding. It's always hard to convince somebody that something didn't happen because they did the right thing, rather than, of course, something really terrible happening because they didn't do the right thing. Um, we have a question for Decide from Jyoti Raj Patra from IIED. Uh, Jyoti Raj, would you like to turn on your mic and ask, or um, I can also read out your question, whatever you'd prefer. Okay, let me ask it. Uh, decide, um, uh, the question is, uh, thank you for sharing IMI's experience in supporting anticipatory action in complex emergencies. What, according to you, are some of the key factors to promote more uptake of research in anticipatory action planning and design? Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for that question. I think it's very uh, timely and very useful question, I think, at this moment. Um, so um, for uh, research to be uh, some, some of the success factors, um, collaboration is the first one. Uh, there's need really to co-create uh, research with um, research partners and also the communities. 
And the second part is also to make sure that whatever research that we are doing, we get time to go back to those uh, communities and provide the feedback and closing the, the feedback loop. And uh, the third point is um, there's need to carry out research that is relevant. For example, I will build from uh, um, the point that um, Green will highlighted that what do we do in the case that um, some of the anticipated actions are not supported by government? So studies such as uh, carrying out cost uh, benefit analysis of uh, anticipatory action can actually prove to be very useful and timely research. So I'll give you an example of some of the studies that I've done, uh, that have been done, that shows that um, for every dollar that is invested in anticipatory action, about seven to nine dollars is saved. So I think it is such kind of studies that can be carried out to demonstrate to the authorities that um, anticipatory action is really useful. Thank you. Uh, there's another question for you from Asina uh, Schmeiter. If you'd like to ask directly, please raise your hand and uh, we can turn the mic over to you. Or I can ask it. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, there's a loud environment, so let me be your voice. Uh, also for Decide, but anybody else in the panel, where are there currently still gaps in research for which we need findings to convince governments? I think Afroza can also possibly take that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody on the panel can, but decide, uh, please start uh, with uh, your experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the first thing is on um, uh, trying to establish an inclusive um, anticipatory action framework especially at the national level. You realize that uh, there are quite a number of uh, fragmented pilot projects, uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to bring those together. So I think uh, there's need for more research to establish um, a coordination framework for anticipatory action. And also um, issues to do with sustainability, um, uh, financing, they still need to uh, establish sustainable financing if you want. To, to make sure that uh, anticipatory action also is uh, given the priority that it deserves. Thank you. Af Afroza, would you like to also respond? Sure. Uh, uh, so for, uh, it actually goes with the priority that government has, like uh, uh, in different scenario in different countries, the priority is different. So uh, in that case, uh, we actually need to align with the government priority government plan and how actually uh, anticipated action could complement or complement the government plan to reduce the vulnerability of the community and also to reduce uh, the disaster impact on, in country. I think that is one of the sector where we need more research on, on different countries and after that, how uh, this anticipated action could link with uh, the government financing mechanism uh, in country because uh, we could provide uh, some uh, some example to the government, some evidence to the government, but it's the government who have to uphold the thing, uh, the mainstream, the thing, and also need to identify uh, some of the financial mechanism in country where they can actually do anticipatory action uh, using their own resources. Uh, uh, like without waiting for the external resources uh, being invested on it. So there we also need some, some of the uh, research to identify what could be the potential uh, funding sources for, for the government to invest on AA and how that could be best used uh, to reduce uh, uh, the vulnerability of the of people in country and also uh, could help the government uh, to be stabilized with, with the development and everything. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure it's a tough ask even for governments. Some governments and some geographies have a lot of challenges, uh, as Idris indicated. You could be firefighting on many fronts at one time. Uh, we have a question from Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, on, on, the, on the area of the research, we, like in Nigeria, we will need uh, what is important there and is lacking is research on the level of compliance of the early warning actions and the tracking of the feedback in terms of monitoring and uh, monitoring and evaluation. That is serious because we have to monitor the level of compliance, evaluate to know where which loop can be strengthened for future improvement. Thank you. 
Absolutely, and also where future funding is most effective, indeed. Um, turning over to Emmanuel, who is in our audience and has just uh, got his hand up. No, there was no human raising the hands up. Sorry. I don't know whether that is an error, but sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm enjoying the conversation. No doubt about that. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, I think one of the questions uh, we've had, I've particularly also had, is about scalability. And, uh, you know, what are the um, areas in which, for example, when it comes to agriculture and uh, land and food security, that we could use a, a um, so uh, maybe uh, one of the panelists can uh, answer about where it's absolutely essential to scale up, but also um, possibly hard as well. Would anybody, Daniel, uh, in, Ni in Nigeria, um, where have you uh, wanted to scale up uh, anticipatory action? Uh, to build resilience, but uh, found it most challenging, perhaps. Uh, we we will want to do that on the area of uh, achieving smart agriculture in respect of the challenges of climate change. Uh, th there is issue of uh, drought that uh, affects the uh, planting, even the flood also and the rainfall. So what area can we improve on this? seedlings and the agricultural practices that the, the farmers will not uh, be at the risk of losing their products. So that, that is a very interesting area for us, how to improve on smart agriculture that take into consideration the rainfall pattern, the flood uh, periods that the farmers can at this time do their planting and at this time undertake harvesting so that they will not be trapped on the web of rainfall and the web of flooding. Yeah, that's an important one. Um, perhaps I can also ask George um, or Idris, the role of collaboration uh, with regional and international partners uh, when you are scaling. So George, you're working with clusters and these are international uh, geographical uh, areas probably that are dealing with a certain kind of risk. So how do you get international players to collaborate when there are different international policies and players and funding agencies involved here? I, I know this is a very large question, but if you can distill uh, some tips on how to scale and make that happen, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, I... I would say that the question that is a challenge, uh, uh, the harmonization of institutional policies to uh, support in the scaling up of uh, from pilots now to scale up. That's what we are grappling with because with uh, we have a regional technical working group on and strategy action with members like over 40, 50 uh, agencies who are doing different things in uh, different contexts with their own institutional lens, but targeting the same region, and it, it becomes difficult for uh, And that's the question that the discussion, some of the discussions, and we, is it possible that we can harmonize even the, under, the, the processes? When you talk about the, some institution called early action protocol, some institution call it anticipatory action plan. Some institution call it anticipatory action framework. So there are so many namings depending on the institutions, which potentially causes confusion to people. So what we are trying to do is to work within a, a technical working group. We have a regional technical working group, which should provide strategic uh, understanding in the region. And finally, the national uh, agencies should also, within their national technical working group, uh, follow the same, borrow the examples from the regional 
So I would say that is one way we are trying to to address some of these institutional uh, diversity. And also a roadmap we developed, uh, we have a regional roadmap on anticipatory action, which tries to gather key areas or pillars that we think is important, focus on the anticipatory action in the region. And in the amongst of those pillars provide very clear uh, guidance or direction on how we can achieve some of those uh, areas. For example, I would give example on uh, uh, financing. Yeah, so we're also trying to see how can, as a region, come up with a, a direction on uh, AA financing that, uh, that can also uh, cascade down to the national and also the, uh, the local level. So in summary, two things, a technical working group helping us to provide harmonization and also the regional roadmap. Interesting. And I'm Thank sure you. Idris uh, has also... Yeah. Um indicated that they've they've made that roadmap and they've made it available um i'm sure there's also challenges of language when you're dealing with diverse groups even within a country so uh, not to end on a downer but we're nearing the end of the session i feel like we've also learned a lot of really good things and even from the challenges there are uh, steps that we can take away as positives uh, that we can uh, anticipate uh, in in our action and also then um, implement when we start working on these uh, mitigation ideas injuries please yeah thank you i agree with george <clears throat> you know the what uh, the international and regional um, collaboration or coordination can help is to to create a common understanding of what anticipatory reactions is. Trust me, there is, there is a lot of difference of understanding uh, within the governments, within the nations, uh, within the region also. So that would be one way, uh, capacity building. And I would hear what I was initially referring to uh, for anticipation hub. I would suggest to anticipation hub that it, uh, you know, nothing can be achieved without resources. So why don't you, uh, as an anticipation hub, come up with an idea of creating an anticipatory actions um, uh, fund at global level, where the donors can contribute and you can uh, facilitate capacity building, uh, common understanding creation, uh, protocols development for specific hazards, for specific jurisdictions, for geographic settings and then also uh, uh, create um, a platform for experience sharing uh, which it is already doing but uh, you know taking uh, taking on further this uh, agenda of anticipatory action and help further evolve it well Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as we near the end of our session, I'd now like to invite Dr. Sandra Rukstol, who's the senior researcher at the International Water Management Institute and co-lead of the CGIR initiative on fragility, conflict and migration to share her reflections on how anticipatory action can help build the a bridge between climate and conflict by acting early to prevent crises from escalating. Uh, Sandy, over to you. Thank you so much, Shavi. Can you hear me okay? All right, I think my, I don't know whose connection is a little foggy or if it's mine. So if anything goes wrong, please just raise your hand, raise or wave your hand. Thank you everybody. This has been an absolutely fantastic discussion with so many um, examples from so many places. And this is what makes these webinars really exciting. So it's been a real honor listening to everybody's uh, stories, I, you know, from West Africa, East Africa, Asia. I'm speaking uh, with you today from Amman, Jordan, where I work a lot on this in the MENA region with a different context. I'll reflect on that a little bit at the end. I'm going to try to make this very fast, um, but some top level headlines I see of sort of action areas, what when we think about the institu institutionalization of, it, of anticipatory action into country systems and governments, 
Um, first, we need to strengthen knowledge and evidence. We spoke about the research agenda, which was very useful. As a researcher, it's really useful to hear what people think needs to be investigated more deeply, but more importantly, how it needs to be applied, because that's what shapes everything that we uh, try to analyze. So um, we need to improve data and research to demonstrate the value of anticipatory action to governments. That's another thing we talked about convincing parties to be a part of this movement. Um, and that's an important part of, uh, of uh, developing uh, evidence uh, for this uh, area of work. Um, it seems that another area to build momentum is to develop multi-hazard approaches. What does that mean? It's extremely complicated. None of us have perfect examples, but we've all worked in very tricky situations to implement um, uh, humanitarian programs to support investment and so on. So what is good practice when it means um, developing these multi-hazard multi approaches? Because when we're trying to build coalitions in this area of work, we know that very few people have one lens. There are different things pulling at the way we choose to spend money on these types of programs um, and uh, in areas of investment, whether it's for early action or even for long-term climate adaptation, which is also informed by this area of work, as we know. So um, aligning protocols and best practices, this is something else that we heard uh, quite a bit about. Um, and this, you know, these webinars um, and everything the Anticipation Hub does gives us uh, a lens to what is good practice. So it's important for us to, to consider, uh, yeah, how do we make these alignments to make things most efficient and to make sure that we're already learning from what's done in the past. Um, capitalizing on emergency situations, the momentum building on them. This is the silver lining of an emergency situation. Several people spoke about crises and all that was learned from them. That can also be a moment for change in terms of how we institutionalize uh, these types of programs. So uh, these are important stories for us to learn from how did change occur in the midst of a crisis. Um, facilitating government and humanitarian dialogue. This was another example that was shared with us, which is really important. So we can understand our different ways of operating, um, how decisions are made from a humanitarian agency perspective, from a government perspective. Again, it all comes down to the allocation of resources uh, in a situation, right? So if we talk together and we understand how we all work, then it can facilitate uh, better decision-making uh, in a situation of crisis. Uh, an interesting example from Nigeria to engage the uh, peace and conflict institutions. How do we do that? I haven't heard of many examples like this, though we have always dreamt of such good practice like that. Um, more examples like that, I would love to hear about if anybody has anything to share on that in the chat here or in any other uh, future uh, webinars that we have. Um, and then community involvement uh, to ensure relevance of these activities. Uh, let's see, I'm going to skip to the bottom of my list of things and just tell you that, first of all, I think, ah, no, this one's very important. I'm not going to skip over this. Building trust in forecasting services. This is extremely important and very difficult to do. We are building trust of everybody who relies on these to make decisions, whether it's at, at the community level or up at the government level. So this is another area that I think where we could really benefit from talking more. How do we build trust in these systems? Um, so I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that governance is key, okay? Um, we know that all of this has to do with how the work is done, not just all the information we have, but how we use it. Um, and we also heard some very interesting stories of the political economy dynamics that operate in the background that determine what happens, what people say and do, how they invest, how they act, and so forth. These are the, the discussions that are very hard to have in a public forum like this, but I hope we can maybe make this a topic of a future webinar or maybe something to talk about in the hallways at the Global Dialogue Platform in Berlin in a couple of weeks. These um, discussions around political economy are at the core of so much of what we each experience in doing this work. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say before I finish, because I know we're over time, or I'm over time, is that I find that one area, one way to take action in this area, again, we're from the International Water Management Institute. We work on food, land, and water systems. Water is in our title. Um, taking a sector-based approach can be effective.
And that's what I have found in the work that we've done in the MENA region is connecting to water sector strategies, connecting to um, a, a landscape approach or watershed management approach when dealing with disasters, when planning for disasters. Taking that sector approach doesn't mean we have tunnel vision completely. I said before that that's something we want to avoid, but it can be a way to mobilize people to facilitate investment and to facilitate policy change. So it's just something maybe, again, we can talk about in, the, in future webinars, because although this is our last one, I think, of 2024, it's not going to be our last one completely. So um, some topics to, to think of in, in the future. And on that point, there was a report, I just put the link in the chat, uh, WMO just launched a report at the same time we were doing this on water and uh, there and DRR and so on. So if you, I put the link here, you can take a look at it. You can watch their YouTube video about this new report. There's a sector approach to what WMO is doing, the water sector approach. So something probably to learn there. So um, that's it, I'll stop there. Sorry for taking so long, Chavi, back to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sandy. And uh, a very big thank you to everyone for today's engaging and insightful discussion. I've just got a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I encourage you to join us at the Global Dialogue platform. We'll be continuing these conversations with our partners, including the International Red Crescent, Sudan Urban Development Think Tank and Resurgence. Our side sessions will be focusing on trusting information in fragile and conflict affected, affected situations, how insecurity and grievance can shape anticipatory action efforts. We are also thrilled to announce that FCM in partnership with Global Dispatches and Mark Goldberg is launching a series of podcast episodes. The link to the podcast is now in your chat. So do subscribe so that you can listen to insightful discussions and stories that highlight the path to resilience and recovery. I hope today's session, in fact, I'm confident today's session has sparked fresh ideas and provided concrete examples of how anticipatory action can be more effectively integrated into government policies. So let's do keep this dialogue going as we work towards building more resilient communities. Uh, it just remains for me to thank our speakers for sharing their valuable insights and their time alphabetically, Afroz Haq, Daniel Obot, Desaid Mabumbo, George Etiano, and Idris Masood. A thousand thanks for your valuable contributions. And finally, a thank you to Nina and the team from CGIR, IMI, and the Anticipation Hub, as well as our wonderful audience. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and keep talking about anticipatory action. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And bye. Thank you.